When you're a celebrity, your fandom is definitely something you have to be careful of. You're immediately put on a pedestal that you have to keep a steady balance upon, or else you'll fall off of it. On one hand, you can have a following that expects the world of you, so one wrong move could see your downfall. On the other, you can do a million questionable things, if not outright bad things, and they could still blindly follow you. We've certainly seen both cases over the years, but there's one more side to parasocial relationships that are just as common as them, if not more so. And that would be the exploitation of fans. Whether it's emotional, physical, and financial, you can see popular figures abuse their power to exploit fans. Sadly, this behavior even occurs in places you don't expect, such as Common Writer. We'll be looking into one of the most infamous cases of exploitation in Rider, and that would be caused by Kamen Rider Super 1's actor, Shunsuke Takasugi. And the story goes deeper than just an actor peddling his fans for cash. Let's start from the beginning. Naoki Iwata was born in July 22nd, 1949. As soon as he graduated high school, he was drafted as a ranger in the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. The service led him to going overseas to serve in the U.S. Army Special Forces. During his year as a Green Beret, he served a six-month tour in the Vietnam War. It was here that he was told he could be a great actor by a fellow Green Beret who also worked in the Japanese film industry, though he originally wanted to be a singer. After his service, he tried following this ambition through the 1970s, trying and failing to secure record deals by day and crooning at bars at night. He became disheartened by these experiences, so, influenced by the film producer's suggestion, he decided to become an actor instead, taking the stage name of Shunsuke Takasugi. Although he used two different kanji spellings of his name throughout his career, he landed several minor roles through his connection and popular manzai comedian Ryutaro Kamioka, of whom he was childhood friends with. He steadily gained more and more important roles in both film and television before having a breakout role in Yasei no Shomei in 1978, Japanese for Evidence of the Wild, and brought into America with the title Never Give Up. The film involves a young girl suffering from trauma-induced amnesia in the aftermath of a massacre in her hometown, the result of a corrupt Japanese JSDF unit that hastily tried to apprehend the attackers without regard for the civilians. With the familiarity of having served as a soldier, Takasugi played the relatively minor role well, and was even credited as guiding the other soldier actors and their authenticity. But it was soon after this film that he realized that if he were too comfortable with being a soldier turned actor, he would be a victim of typecasting. He wanted much more than this. Common Rider at the time was enjoying a lukewarm reception to its revival series, the new Common Rider, especially with its own Hiroaki Murakami. He led an incredible career afterwards, somewhat eclipsing his role as Sky Rider. Even then, he was said to be reluctant to audition for the role, let alone being indecisive about taking it on. Compare this to Takasugi, who was said to be eager to become Kamen Rider. His army service once again put odds in his favor, with Shotaro Yoshinomori and producer Toro Hariyama both believing in his abilities as a role model for kids. And so, Kamen Rider Super 1 aired from October 17th, 1980 and ending on October 3rd the next year. Funnily enough, Tagasugi started his music career by singing the Super 1 opening theme, ending theme, as well as a couple of insert tracks. The season, surprisingly, did pretty alright in viewership, garnering about 10% across Kanto and Kansai regions. It didn't reach the heights of Sky Rider, no pun intended, but it at least did comparable to other successful tokusatsus at the time, such as Denji Man. Fans also remember the season fondly, with Con Rider Spirits creator Kenichi Muraida considering the first half of it to have the best storytelling from the era. Sadly, it wasn't enough for them to continue the series with a new season, and thus, Rider once again went on hiatus. In the years following the show's end, Takasugi kept a seemingly warm relationship with his fans, appearing at conventions frequently. He also managed to be cordial with other writer actors. Despite his fellow actors' penchant for nights at the bars, he preferred oolong tea outing. He was even joked as being the writer who typically drive the others home. To say that he had a good reputation was an understatement. He basically had everything going for him, except for a couple of things. Early into the production of Super 1, and even for a couple years after that, Takasugi's age was reported to be 27 years old, though older than the 23-year-old Marukami in his role as Skyrider. 27 was still what the industry considered to be a prime age to be working in. However, this age turned out to be false. Later biographies by Takasugi would mention his birth year as being in 1941, placing him as 31 years old during the filming of Super 1. It's unclear whether this mistake in putting out his age was on behalf of Toei or 
or Takasugi himself. Of course, this could be disregarded as a simple mistake, but the fact remains that it doesn't look good amongst Takasugi's other examples of manipulation. There were murmurs of these stories starting as early as 2004, wherein they described Takasugi as repeatedly asking specific individuals he met at fan gatherings for money, the reason being was that he said he was struggling financially. This didn't quite line up with Takasugi's career at this point. He was receiving screen roles throughout the 90s and 2000s. His son from a previous marriage was a music label executive, and his frequent appearances at events were something to take note of. However, the stories didn't stop there. In 2013, there was a bombshell report of many of his victims coming forward to detail the number of times they were manipulated for their money. Disturbingly, many of his victims were women, a number of whom promised romantic favors. The most popular report counted four victims who were owed 50 million yen by Takasugi. However, research shows that both the number of victims and amount of money he manipulated them out of were much higher than that. Let's take a look at some of these accounts. Of course, unless stated otherwise, every victim here is anonymous. Therefore, their genders and identities will be kept hidden in reporting. With what I said earlier about many of the victims being women, you can probably connect the dots on your own. Victim B A fan, identified as B, sent out a letter to Shunsuke Takasugi in 2004, expressing her gratitude towards Takasugi in his part as Kamen Rider Super 1. In the reply they got back, Takasugi started friendly enough, up until he detailed being involved in a road accident and that he needed to pay off the other person. Takasugi suggested that B give him money for this incident with the intention of keeping his reputation clean. B was somewhat cautious at first, but they believed that Takasugi would have to owe them in the long run. So they gave Takasugi the 50,000 yen that he asked for. Afterwards, Takasugi kept in contact with B. B was invited to events that Takasugi was participating in, though they only appeared at one of them as they usually didn't fit their schedule. Then, out of nowhere, Takasugi showed up at B's door. Despite the few letters and one-time meetup, Takasugi seemed way too friendly with B, to put it lightly. He told him a story about his various problems going on. I have a herniated disc. I can't work for a while. My rent is due, and my phone service was cancelled, all in the middle of me moving houses. I need help, B. Could you please lend me 100,000 yen? Though all that B had at the time was 50,000, Takasugi graciously took it. That's when Takasugi Takasugi started popping up in B's life again and again. He showed up physically once and many times on the phone. He would ask for money every single time. I need 30,000 yen. I need 50,000 yen because I'm starving. 20,000. 100,000. I'm sure you get the picture. It all came to a halt when B told them that if they were to pay him any more money, he would have to agree to a loan certificate. And that's when Takasugi could contact B. Victim D one of the most bizarre cases of Takasugi's emotional manipulation, D started emailing him when they were 18, again expressing nostalgia and gratitude towards Super 1. Suddenly in 2010, Takasugi emailed D, saying that he needed to pay off an abortion. Expecting this to be a one-time incident, D paid Takasugi. After this, Takasugi started pestering D again and again for money, following the patterns of victim B. This time, however, Takasugi made a promise that at the next gathering he's at, he will pay D everything that he owes them. D compromised and agreed to do so. Then, Takasugi never appeared at the gathering. They kept up contact with each other, only this time, Takasugi went back to ask for more money. D eventually had enough, telling off Takasugi. Then, he cut contact with D. Victim E Another person who contacted Takasugi online, Victim E, was a member of his fan clubs at the time. Interestingly, he never begged them for money for a couple of years, but he eventually did with the story that he is being threatened by Lone Shark from the Yakuza. It was either he pays them 550,000 yen, or they kill him. Despite the urgency to give Takasugi the money, they hesitated and called another member of the fan club, who hasn't gone forward with their own story yet. They warned E not to pay him the money, as they had been scammed by Takasugi before. Thankfully, E backed out of the transaction, and of course, Takasugi cut all contact with them. Guess he got killed by the Yakuza after all. Oh wait, no he didn't. Akira Hariyama and how he nearly got run over. While writing this, I try to keep this as brief as I can while trying to show the most unique examples of Takasugi's behavior I can find. 
mind. That being said, many of them show repetitive patterns. Takasugi would lure nostalgic fans in and tell as many sob stories as he can to try to win their money. In some cases I've stated before, he would do so with intense pressure on whoever he targeted at the time, whether it would be showing up at their doors or to put them in life or death situation. I chose not to delve into many of the intricacies for the sake of being concise and cautious around. For example, the whole, my original Super 1 belt got stolen by the Yakuza fib was told to a few different victims, including towards a man who's referred in the press as Tanaka. Although he was one of the most extorted individuals in this whole thing, having been owed 10 million yen, he was also given most of what I've already described. That being said, if you've heard of the Takasugi scandal before, you've probably heard a version of this specific report, being of Akira Hariyama. Akira Hariyama is known for conducting many fan gatherings for veteran toku actors and personalities. He was foundational in bringing back attention for a lot of them, including that of Toto Okazaki, the actor for Amazon. He got to enjoy a bit of press attention when Amazons came out because of Hariyama. For a brief period in 2009, he managed Shunsuke Takasugi, up until he started to pull him into the whole, the Yakuza are after me, and only you can stop them with the numbers on your credit card stick. Hariyama was peddled pretty badly for a time, even years after their partnership ended. On April 8th, 2016, he, along with an anonymous female fan who had received the brunt of Takasugi's emotional manipulation, showed up at Takasugi's doorstep to find out why he hasn't shown up to his own court case involving them both, to which Takasugi responded by performing a dogeza. You've probably seen this image of Takasugi performing a dogeza again towards a few of his victims in the park. What is a dogeza, you may ask? It's a custom in Japan in which you kneel, prostrate your body, and bow your head on the ground towards somebody. You act it out to ask an incredible favor for someone, or in Takasugi's case, in order to profusely apologize to somebody. It's a really important form of etiquette in Japanese culture that you probably don't want to perform more than once a year. So how many times did Takasugi do it? Well, from what I found out, three. Three times in one year. It was at that point that another court case was leveled against Takasugi that Hariyama was also participating in. The court date was on the 22nd of that month, two weeks after the first date. And yet again, Takasugi did not appear. Hariyama, along with a couple more victims, visited Takasugi's house once again and found that he wasn't home and that the car that he usually parked was gone. Oh yeah, he also noticed that the car's registration expired in October 2015, last time he was around. Kind of ties everything together, doesn't it? So Hariyama quietly gave up and went to a nearby supermarket where he found Takasugi's car. Interestingly, a woman was in the passenger seat, estimated to be around her early 20s, and the driver's seat was lowered. Though he can tell that he was hunched over, he could still see the top of Takasugi's head poking through. Hariyama approached the front of the vehicle, and suddenly, the car turned on. The car dashed towards Hariyama. Had he not gotten out of the way in time, something serious might have happened. So, um, Super 1 almost killed a guy. Yeah. Takasugi appeared on morning news program Tokudane later on in May of 2016 to discuss his debt. He had misconstrued a lot of the events that occurred in his favor, and ended it off by saying that he would do his best to give back to those he affected. Since January 2017, he has disappeared, disobeying court orders and cutting all contact with everybody. Effectively, he is a fugitive of the law. Shunsuke Takasugi kind of became an inside joke between those in the know and the writer community. Heck, we've joked about it on this channel before too. But, as always, these things have people on the other side who were affected. They have debt because of Takasugi, and for no reason at all. They looked up to this man and were exploited for it, just because they grew up with Super 1 rather than V3, or X, or Stronger, or any other Tokus Satsu actor who wouldn't do this to their fans. In one way or another, despite Takasugi fleeing from his legal action against him, maybe he's still paying the price. He can't extort people anymore, nor can he hold on to the legacy his role in Kamen Rider left him. Or maybe he never cared about it in the first place. He apparently extorted a mother of one of the kid actors who was in the Junior Rider Kid Corps. I don't know what moral to take from this. Well, basically, don't be a sociopath. Don't exploit and abuse the goods you have in life, I guess. That's a pretty low bar. I know, but I think we should take this as a cautionary tale. I'm not gonna say something as generic as never meet your heroes, but with stories like this, I think we should all just be careful. And for anybody with a fan base, love your fans, but love them distantly. And anybody with heroes, love your heroes, but love them distantly.